Jeremiah chapter 17. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. I'm not going to break it. Be very careful the word iron where it shows up in the Bible. Iron does not have a good context. And with a point of a diamond. Diamonds are the hardest thing and they're used for drill bits. To drill what is a, a, what a normal drill bit can't drill. I believe a diamond can only cut into a diamond. So you got a pen of iron and the point is a diamond. It shows you what kind of writing instruments they had back then. It'd be like a stick or a rod and with a point. And you would use something like that to write into wood, rock, metal. It's an etching, engraving. As it said, it is graven upon the table of their heart. That's the inside. And when we get to verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. And upon the horns of your altars, not God's. So what is the sin of Judah? It's upon the heart, for with the heart man believes on the righteousness. Sin is deceitful, I mean the heart is above, is deceitful above all things. For out of the heart, Jesus says, then comes adulteries uh, and all the sins. And your altars, it's not the altars of God. It's altars plural. It's the worship of false gods is a sin. And there's all kinds of altars in America. And they are being written down. Recorded. Listen, if God records Jeremiah, if God records Isaiah, if God records the life of Paul, the life of Moses, the life of Joseph, the life of Naaman, all the people we find in the Bible, don't you think that he's recorded a life of yours? And yet, with this kind of writing instrument, God is writing down my sins of impatience and all my sins, which I'm not going to tell you I do. I'll tell you impatience. And you would figure with a, with a diamond point being engraven of my sins, it cannot be erased. Yet 1 John 1 9 says, If I confess my sins, God is able and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. The writing of that diamond point upon my sins can be washed under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It can be erased. My heart writes out my sins. False worship are my sins being worship, being written down well, whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees what was the s of snakes and upon high hills Children will follow the wrong of their parents. Very likely will they follow the good of their parents, but they'll definitely follow what's wrong with the parents. And that's what these children are doing. They're following the wickedness of their fathers, the wickedness of their mothers, to do evil and sin. O oh, my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil. The army that's going to come. And thy high places for sin. Where they're worshiping the gods. The Babel. Let's build ourselves a way to get into heaven. Let's get closer to the stars so we can find out what our horoscope says. 
throughout all thy borders of the nation of Israel, of the land of Judah, of the area of Jerusalem, in the borders thereof, there is false God worship. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. I will cause thee to serve thy enemies, Babylon, in the hand which thou knowest not. They have no idea who Babylon is. And they're going to Babylon. They're going to the land of Shinar. And we're going to see, I don't know if it's tonight or if I read it today. They're going there for 70 years. Uh, the wilderness was 40 years. Babylon is 70 years. You know how long Israel has been without a priest, without a temple, without a altar, without a king since 70 AD? And this is 2015. I, I can't do that kind of math in my head, but see how long that's been. I'm trying to figure it out. It's an awful long time. For ye have kindled a fire in my anger. How'd you anger God? Your altars, your heart, your groves, your green trees, your high hills, your mountains. Your worshiping of gods has angered God, which shall burn forever. Where do you know of a place that will burn forever? Guess where they're going. I don't need to mention that place, because the name of the place itself just gets even Christians upset. I mean, I would be very vile if I would say the word hell. I'm sorry. But what is that? What place is fire that burns forever? It is hell. Where do you go when you worship other gods? You go to hell. Can a Christian that worship other gods go to hell? No, you're saved. You're eternally saved. But we're in the Old Testament. Find me in the Old Testament a sacrifice that a man could bring for worshiping other gods. Yet God tells him over and over, get right, forsake it, get back to me. When you worship false gods in the Old Testament, you didn't bring a calf, you didn't bring a lamb, you didn't bring a goat, you brought your heart. Even adultery and murder, there was no, that was it. You're gone, you're cut off. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, army, money, friendship, family, and maketh flesh his arm. I mean, you're just trusting whatever it is you need to trust in, you're trusting in flesh. You're not trusting in God. Asa ran off to the doctors right away without seeking God first. That woman that had the infirmity for 12 years went to men first before she came to Jesus. And Jesus said, they that are sick, they need a physician. But go to God first. David would pray to the Lord. Lord, uh, if I go into this town, are you going to be with me? Yes, I'm going to be with you. Lord, if I continue, are you going to? Yes. Lord, how do you want me to do it? And the Lord will lay it out. Joshua one time relied on the numbers and the strength of the people, and he got his butt kicked. And that's the only war he lost. When those, uh, those Canaanites or the, the people of the land came to him, said, we come from a far country, did he seek God? No, he didn't seek God. He trusted the men, and guess what? 
he found out later that they were deceivers. Be careful of man, for the Lord knoweth the heart. Samuel went to David's, uh, yeah, David's brothers. Oh, look at this guy, guys. I ain't interested in him. Didn't we already look at the size? Didn't we already look at the stature of a man? Didn't we, didn't we do that before Saul? I mean, Samuel, about Saul? Yeah, we did. Look what happened. I'm looking for a man of the heart. I'm looking at his heart. And that's the issue here. Listen, if, if they will turn from God, what do you think they're going to do to you? I mean, you really going to trust a politician or a used car salesman? Really? You better seek God. And whose heart departed from the Lord. Oh yeah, you're going to really trust in someone who, who left God. That's like, you know, you read your Bible, you do right, and you come to a situation in your life, and you call the first backslider. Hey, how are you doing? What do you think I should do? Poor advice. Get down your knees. Seek God. For he shall be like a heath. That's a plant. In the desert. A bush. It said in England that this kind of thing is used for brooms. It's a poor man's bedding. So it's a, a, a bush or plant that's just a lot of in the desert. There's not much life in the desert. Dry. And shall not see when good cometh. This is Psalms 1, 4 through 6. But shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. Wilderness where there's nothing. There's no life in the wilderness. In a salt land, salt land, very bad land. You can't grow in a land that's been salted and not inhabited. So who cares about this land? What's it going to do when there's no one there? What's it going to do when there's no fertile ground? It's going to be a very dry kind of plant. Read Psalms 1 verses 4 through 6. Now Psalms 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is a man that trusts in the Lord. Contrast to verse six. You get one. You get one verse about this dead plant in a in a desert, and you get three verses of the blessed a man as a tree. Blessed is a man. Happy is the man that trusts in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. What's your hope? What is your hope today? Money, fame, career, ball team, marriage, death, stocks. What is it? If it's not the Lord, you are not happy as the man. For he, the man, shall be as a tree planted by the water. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. There's life. Doesn't the Bible speak about a man supposed to have fruit? Well, here's a tree that's alive. Jesus said, I'm the water of life. And when you do right, you'll get the fruit of the Spirit. One fruit. It's not fruits. Wherefore, wherefore by their fruits you should know them. You should know they're a Christian or not. How? By looking at the fruit. For you shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river. You know, those roots, I mean, once they find water, man, they just, whoo, straws. Life. Good, healthy cells. And shall not see when heat cometh like that hearth, in verse 6. It's going to get hot in that, in that Trees are sitting by that river. Ooh, I'm cool. I'm getting a nice, getting nice drink of water here. That earth doesn't have to, I mean, only when it rains in the desert. Or dew. In the morning. But her leaf shall be green. Life. Now it says about that earth. 
it does have a small green leaf, and it's it's evergreen. It's an evergreen tree, shining light. But that's part of the plant. This plant is green because of the water. Trees produce fruit. That bush, I couldn't find any fruit except for a broom. Place to sleep. Even if a tree doesn't have physical fruit, cedars are very useful that you can use them in your closet. Very ornamental smelling wood. Some some trees produce the best wood for building. Some trees are good for starting for starting fires and having a good long fire. Some trees provide shade. We need that in Florida. We ain't got shade cheese around here. Uh, trees, the bark, and, and trees are made to make paper. They make furniture. They make all kinds of things. I mean, when you think of fruit, don't think of something you pick off and you start biting. Some Christians may not produce fruit as in souls, but all the other things that they give. Some Christians give their money to the church like they're supposed to, even more. Well, money comes from trees. Do you think money grows on trees? Yes, it does. It's paper. Do I? And shall not be careful in the year of drought. Why? It's planted by a, by a river. It's not raining, but, oh, that thing is sucking the water of the river. In drought, that hurt or health, however you want to say it, Heath, he's over there. He's having times of, I need something to drink. He's got life, but, oh, man, I need some. This tree is, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. And what happens when this tree does drop fruit? It's got fruit that you can pick. A pine cone tree, and uh, an apple tree, or, or a coconut. Their seeds go up on the ground, and they produce other trees. You know what's interesting about a coconut tree, and we've seen them down here in Florida, is the coconuts will fall off the tree, and they need to be soaking in brine of the salt water. And they'll wash up somewhere onto a beach, settle on the ground, and boom, you got a tree growing. Cast I bread upon many waters. Study fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things. So when you got a condition in your life, it's not your head, it's not your mind. I like to look at pornography. I like to drink beer. I like to gamble. Doctor, give me a pill to help me. Let me sit in a group and talk to a bunch of people in a circle. How you get the heart issue? For God looketh upon the heart. That is something you gotta get down in your in your knees. You gotta get down in your heart. You gotta get down to God and you alone. Contrite spirit. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. You gotta get down with God, not a doctor, not with pills. It's a battle of the flesh. It is a battle of the lust. And the spirit is envy. I mean, the spirit is, is a horde of the flesh. And the flesh is of a horde of the spirit. But the flesh will not give you armor. But the spirit has. And desperately wicked. How do you like that one? John 2.25, 1 Samuel 
Who can know it? You gonna go to a doctor? Oh yeah, they can take a picture of your heart. They can see it heart beating. They can take how many pulses you have, your blood pressure, and that. But what what is the true heart of man? You know, as you can go to a church and see somebody and not realize what their heart really is. You don't know what their private life is. You don't know what they're doing alone. Boy, I've seen that one. I've seen someone act one way, and boy, they are in another whole totally different way. See, you can't see the heart. You may have someone say, oh, I just love you forever, true love forever. You don't know what, what it is. And time will not tell. How many people's gone many, many, many years in marriage and end up with a flop of a divorce? God knows the hearts. Because look what he says, I, the Lord, search the heart. God knows your reason. God knows your purpose. God knows why. And God knows what you're made of. And God knows what you're capable of. And God knows who you are. And God really knows what you want to do. Even though the flesh gets in the way. And with this vile, wicked, deceitful, desperately wicked heart that we have, if God knows that really you want to do right despite that, despite your heart, He can work with you. You know, if you got a habit you can't overcome, because you don't want to overcome it. Oh, I pray, pray. Get, get off it. If you really wanted to quit, you were really serious about quitting, and you were really serious with God, you had already quit. I've already been through that. I've been through it with alcohol, and been through it with cigarettes. One was easy as pie, and the other one took took many time. And you know, all I did was keep fooling myself. And finally, one time, I now I'm in, I'm just enjoying this, and I ought not. I try the reins. What what's ho what's making you turn? Reins are upon a horse. You control the horse. Who's controlling you? Remember what God told Cain, sin lieth at the door? Are you going to open that door? Or are you going to open the door to Jesus Christ who's knocking? When it's time to serve the Lord, what gets your turn? Fishing? Even to give every man according to his ways. Uh-oh. That's a scary thought. You know, you know what I ought to get for my ways? I ought to get hell and destruction. I'm a sinner. There are things I've done to people both knowingly knowing doing it. And there's things I've done to people I don't know. Don't you think I ought to be sowing all that? God's mercy and grace. And according to the fruit, verse 8, of his doing. Jesus said, wherefore by their fruit she should know them. As the partridge sitteth on the eggs, and hatches them not. So he that getteth riches, and not by right, he got them by wrong, shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool.
Well, those eggs don't hatch. There's no little partridges. There's no young. No more life. Nothing to live for. And the riches will be left behind. What can they do? When the doctor says it's terminal. What can they do to, to mend a broken heart? What can they do when you have no joy? Oh, I'll go buy marijuana. Yeah, and when you're done with the marijuana, what do you do after that? You go buy more. And that ain't strong enough, then you go into the next big drug. And when that's not done enough, you get the next big drug. And then you're broke, and you're stealing. And you're still not satisfied. If beer was good and, and satisfying, why don't you just ever just have one can of beer for your entire life? Wouldn't that be great? Drink that one beer, one one can of beer, and you're happy for the no. You gotta go have another one. They come in six and twelve and twenty four and, and kegs. Why do they come in that vast quantity? Because the first sip does not satisfy. Then what do you do when you drive home and you kill somebody? What do you do when the doctor tells you your liver has failed? What, is it, what do you do when the doctor tells you your pancreas is going to give you extreme pain for the rest of your life? What are you going to do when your family is gone because you drank them away? And I can go on all the drugs. This guy gets riches by wrong. He steals, he lies, he swindles. And God does not approve of that. He approves of an honest making of a living. If you become a millionaire and you've done it by hard work, God has nothing against that. If you use it to his honor and glory and you've done it right. A glorious high throne from the beginning is place of our sanctuary. O oh Lord, the hope of Israel. Well, they've been hoping in gods, stars, moons. But this is Jeremiah speaking. All that forsake thee shall be ashamed. Can you imagine someone turning from God, standing before God one day at the great white throne? You want to talk about a source of embarrassment. I don't believe in God. And there you are standing before him. You've taught thousands, if not millions of, of young people, there is no God, it's a source of evolution. And there you are standing before the God, the creator. You have led millions, if not billions, of people to worship a woman. And then when you stand before God, and you realize he's a man. The man Christ Jesus. You imagine standing before God one day and you corrected his word? They that depart from me... Now look at that. Did you get that? O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be, shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me. When did God take over the conversation for, here's Jeremiah speaking, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and in God speaks, and they that depart from me shall be Jeremiah never finished the sentence. God knew exactly what Jeremiah was going to say. Let me finish for you, Jeremiah. How do you like that for verbal inspiration? God cut Jeremiah off. That wasn't proper. Shall be written in the earth. That's interesting because you know what? 
The heroes of America are anyone but godly. And yet there were a time that the heroes were the preachers, were the circuit writers, were the missionaries, were the preachers. No more. That's because we cease from being a Christian nation. I've never seen a, a, a city or a town have a road named Jesus. But I've seen a lot of MLKs. I don't know of a town or place in America named God. But I know a lot of Washingtons. Heard of a few Lincolns. Because they have forsaken the Lord. What have we been talking about? The fountain of living waters. Now, picture this. You want a funny story? A cartoon that we would grow up. Here's a tree. He's by a river. Ah, oh, water. Nice fruit. And the tree picks himself up and runs away to the desert. You ever see that happen? You know, the, the drunk. The tree jumped in front of the car. You think, yeah, likely story. And that's what God's saying here. They have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. That tree that was healthy that we read in verse 7 and 8 has got up and left God. And according to, uh, to John chapter 4, you know who stepped in? A Gentile. The woman at the well. And you know what her fruit was? The entire city came and got saved. She left her bucket. I wonder what that bucket was made of. If wood or metal. John 3, 5. John 4, 10. And John 7, 38. They have left God. You know what God provided them in, in the wilderness? A source of living water. A rock. And when they got in the land, they got proud, they got rich. You know, they weren't giving judgment to the widows and the fatherless. They were rebuking them. They were turning them away. They were changing the laws and everything, making money out of wrongness, if I can use that word. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. So being healed is different from saving. Well, you know, see, I got involved in this auto accident, and I came back to life, and that's my salvation. No. You were healed from the automobile accident. When have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Well, the accident. I, I came back to life after seeing this light in the tunnel. Being healed is not salvation. Sorry, Christian science. Sorry, Pentecostals, with your, your faith healing. Healing is not salvation. Healing is being healed. Saving is being saved. And I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Jer Jeremiah went back talking again. Or he speaks for God in verse 13. Pronouns are very interesting when you mark them in the Bible, especially God's pronoun. Behold, they say unto me, Jeremiah is having a conversation with God. And it's like, God doesn't know. And God never, re Jeremiah, I already know what they said. He doesn't say it. He just listens to Jeremiah. God is patient. You know, if he only had this conversation with Adam, if he only had this conversation with Cain, say, Lord, I got all this fruit and all that. I know we're supposed to have, have an offering such and such day. Is this what you want? And by the way, Cain, no, it's not. Oh, it's not? No. Well, what do you want? I want blood of a lamb. 
Well, God, uh, I don't have no lamb. Uh, you've got a brother who's got lamb, and he likes corn. Why don't you give him that corn? He'll give you a lamb. Yeah, that's not a good idea. Jeremiah is having a conversation with God, and God already knows. So, in your prayer life, don't say God knows what I'm thinking, God knows what I'm going through, and not mention it. Tell God. He wants you to hear from it. He's not going to say, I already know, idiot. Yes, he knows your problems, but he wants you to tell them. Behold, they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. Like they really wanted it. You imagine what Jeremiah is saying, Lord, this ain't, where is your word? And he ain't doing nothing about it. As for me, as for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. Lord, I didn't want this position. I didn't go to school for this. This is not my life desire. Uh, Lord, you told me in chapter 1, you called me from the belly. You called me from the womb to do this job. I didn't want it. Neither have I desired a woeful day of these people who don't want me. <laughs> God, this is not very good on my resume. I'm supposed to have a good report of the people according to uh, uh, Timothy there. Paul writes about the, the preacher. He said, have a good report. With, can you imagine, uh, what do you have to say about Jeremiah? Oh, can you imagine what they would say about him? Thou knowest. God, you know. See, God, you know. Now I'm telling you my problems. I'm telling you my concerns. I'm telling you what I'm thinking. I'm being with my mouth not careless before you, God. It's like he's sitting down with God just having a conversation. You, met, you just met where he is. I mean, is he sitting underneath a tree? Is he sitting in his house? Is he walking to the temple? Where is this? He's just having this conversation with God, and no one's interrupting him. No cell phones. No cars buzzing by. No interruptions. That which came out of my lips was right before thee. Because that's what God told him to say. If God told him what to say, then it's right. You, you're turning people away by saying, hell, 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 hell. Well, that's what God told me to say. Be not a terror unto me. Thou art my hope in the day of evil. See, Jeremiah knows what's coming. He doesn't know the foot, but he, know, uh, he knows evil is coming. He believes what God has been telling him. He's the only one. He's been listening to God saying, ooh wee How many of you ever had any private conversations with God? God, can I get out of here now? Can I preach to him and leave? No. I want you, and that one time, I want you to go to Euphrates. All right, but you're coming back. No. Yes. Paul, I went up to the third heaven. <laughs> what? I got to go back down? Yes. No. Yes. You think when when Abraham had to, his, God described him as as a friend? You imagine when Abraham just thanked to God, he's like, "No, stay here. No, you gotta go on. No." Let them be confounded. That's uh, disorder. That persecute me. He's being persecuted. But let not me be confounded. Let me not be in disorder. Let them be dismayed, but let me not be dismayed. Being upon them the day of evil, destroy them with double destruction. Oh, Jeremiah, you meanie. God, go get them. Vengeance is you, saith you, Lord. <laughs> go get them. Jeremiah knows what's coming. He knows by now 
the people ain't going to listen. But that doesn't stop God from warning them. We got what? 45 more chapters, something like that? Even Jeremiah has said, God, they're not listening. Get them. And God, I'm not done. Not yet. Maybe there's hope. Maybe somebody will listen to you, Jeremiah. I know they won't, but I'm going to give them an opportunity. Come on, Lord, have the rapture happen. Yeah, and what about that night you went to prison and that guy trusted me as your Savior? Oh, okay. Hey, I got an idea. What, Lord? What if I came April 23rd, 1987? Well, I was saved January 20, I mean April 24th. That's right. What if I had the rapture the day before you were saved? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand. And even I fall. I'm like, Lord, these people, they don't care. I, I, I do it. Let's just go home. They don't care. Thank God the Lord's long-suffering. And, and, and you, don't, you don't need to rely on my judgment. i got to judge myself. Thank God I don't have to judge you. Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in. This is where the kings come in. And by the which they go out. And in all the gates of Jerusalem. And say unto them. Jeremiah wants you to be a street preacher. Again. I've had Christians tell me street preacher. Blah, blah, blah. It's in the Bible. Jeremiah went in the gates of the city. Where they're going to go in and out. And he preached the word. And say unto them, Hear the word of the Lord, ye kings. Of, oh, now he's going up. Now he's going to speak to the kings. He's dealt with the people. He's dealt with his hometown. He's going to deal with the priests. Now he's dealing with the, with the government of figures. I would love to have the opportunity one day to stand before uh, President Barack Obama. What would you do? Would you tell him how bad he was? No, I would tell him about Jesus Christ. If I can only say two words to him, I would say, Jesus saves. I pray that if I ever had that opportunity, that's what I would do. Because Jeremiah is going to go before the wicked king. And he's not going to tell him how bad he is. He's going to tell him about what God has to say. Thus saith the Lord, take heed to yourselves. And bear no burden on the Sabbath day. Now there's the Sabbath. This is not the church. This is the Jews. Nor bring in by the gates of Jerusalem. Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the gates of the grocery stores. I want you to tell them stop wheeling those carriages around. And stop carrying those baskets. And stop shopping. I want you to tell those trucks stop delivering stuff. Stop picking up stuff. I want you to tell them no deliveries and no receiving at all on this day. Shut down all the businesses on the Sabbath. That's what he's telling them. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day. Don't carry nothing. Boy, they took that to the stream with Jesus. Neither do any work. What work did Jesus do on the Sabbath? Be healed. What work was that? I mean, did he take a scalpel out? He just said something. But hallow ye the Sabbath day as I command your fathers, Jews, Jerusalem, Judah, not Gentiles. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. We gotta make money. Deuteronomy thirty-one twenty-seven, Ezekiel two four. 
And shall come to pass, if ye diligently hearken unto me, here's a chance to repent, saith the Lord, to bring in no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day to do no work therein. Listen, all you got to do is this time, just don't do no work. One day, 24 hours. Then shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes, sitting upon the throne of David, riding upon chariots, and on horses, they and their princes, and the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And this city shall remain forever. Does it? No. Guess what they did? They did not listen to God. And they shall come from the cities of Judah, from the places about Jerusalem, and from the land of Benjamin. That's where Jerusalem is. And from the plain, and from the mountains, and from the south, bring in burnt offerings, and sacrifices, and meat offerings, and incense, and bring in sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord for God. But if ye will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, and not to bear any burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and he does, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it will, and it shall not be quenched. It says, uh, verse 19, Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in, a pacific gate, and by the which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem. Jeremiah was told to go all the gates and preach his message about the Sabbath. The same message. Well, you go down to the farmers and you preach the same message week after week after week. You quote the same scripture. Exactly what Jeremiah did. That's exactly what Jeremiah did. Why? Because they didn't get the first point. They didn't get the outline. Had they had they here received the Sabbath and got right and God said, okay, I got something better for more for them. But they don't. Had somebody come up and everyone gets saved at the, the farmer's market, okay, then okay, we'll move from salvation. But they haven't got saved, so I'm going to keep preaching salvation. Why would I preach about the judgment seat of Christ or the coming apocalypse or anything like that if they're not saved? They got to know Christ as their Savior first. They got to know that they're violating their sin. They're violating what God told them. They got to know on the streets in America in 2015 what the violation they're doing of the Word of God. Because some don't know. Some do know and don't care. And they got to be told over and over and over and over. That's where we lie there.